morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what issues were discussed at the last meeting of the British Irish Council. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The successful uh, British Irish Council summit was held in Guernsey on the 13th of June, and we discussed the economic situation with a consensus that there was cautious optimism, but a need to look at the nature of recovery and sustainability of growth. We discussed the importance of good transport links with a strong case for changes to air passenger duty, the reduction of which would allow Scotland's airports to become more competitive in attracting new direct routes and improve our international connectivity. We also considered various work streams, including spatial planning, and copies of the Communique and the BIC annual report are available on the British Irish Council website. Will the coffee? Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? At a recent meeting of the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly in Dublin that I attended, the Chief Executive of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary, described air passenger duty as a mindlessly insane policy of the UK Government in that it taxes tourists before they arrive. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain what the further benefits to Scotland and the rest of these isles will be after a yes vote when we reduce and then scrap air passenger duty as the Irish Government has already done? There was extensive discussion at the British Irish Council about air passenger duty. Uh, it was indicated that Ryanair have said they would deliver an additional one million passengers uh, as a direct result of the Irish Government's decision to abolish their uh, air travel tax from April 2014. We also shared with the British Irish Council information from the York Aviation Study uh, commissioned by by Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow airports that found that by 2016 there will have been £210 million less per annum spent in Scotland by inbound visitors uh, than if APD had not risen as it has since 2007. Quite clearly a strong case for more powers for this Parliament to make sure that we can make the difference for our economy. Question two, John Mason. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the recent reports of significant levels of disruption to residents in Dilmarnock because of the Commonwealth Games. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robeson. I am grateful for the patience shown by local residents and in particular the Dilmarnock community. Preparation for the Games has led to some unavoidable disruption. Planning has taken place among a wide range of bodies, including Glasgow City Council, the Organising Committee and the Emergency Services, to ensure that the effects on the community are minimised as we come ever closer to what will be a hugely successful Games for Glasgow, and which will bring long-term benefits to the city and to the communities within the East End in particular. Joe Mason. I thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if she would agree with me that for a resident in Springfield Road coming out of their house, they have a small garden, they have the pavement, and then immediately there is an eight-foot fence, which it has to be said is not particularly attractive, and that is going to sit there for three months. Uh, I think the residents do accept those long-term benefits, but would she encourage some form of recompense or at least acknowledgement to the local residents that they have been put out somewhat? Um, can I say to John Mason that I, I am aware that the security fencing in particular has caused um, some uh, concern by local residents. I think that's um, an inevitability of the close proximity between the venues and the, the local uh, community. Um, Obviously, security is of, of paramount concern and the planning around security has, has got the best overlay of security to make sure that we deliver a secure Games, but that has meant the close proximity to uh, some residents' uh, housing. In terms of acknowledging um, the disruption, I think I've done that in my previous answer, but in terms of recompense, uh, I'm sure John Mason is aware that there are discussions going on uh, with the local community between Glasgow City Council, the organising committee and local residents uh, about uh, how that might uh, be taken forward. I know that uh, John Mason has been very active around this issue and has made a number of suggestions, including the issuing of free tickets. Uh, what I can say to him on that is that uh, those discussions are ongoing and the Scottish Government would certainly support the organising committee in recognising uh, that disruption through perhaps the granting of free tickets uh, and uh, support to community events and perhaps other matters uh, and those discussions will continue uh, hopefully to a successful resolution. Question three, Ken McIntosh. To ask the Scottish Government what the reason is for the 13% increase in complaints about hospital and community health services and the 36% increase in relation to family health services between 2012-2013. 
Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, the official NHS complaint statistics for 2012-13 were released by IISD on the 24th of September 2013. This was the first NHS complaint statistics report since the introduction in April 2012 of the right to give feedback, make comments, raise concerns and make complaints about health care introduced by the Patient Rights Scotland Act 2011. Numbers were expected to rise in the short term as a result of people's increased awareness of the right to give feedback or make a complaint. We expect the NHS to demonstrate that it is listening, learning and making improvements as a result of these complaints. Okay, McIntosh. Uh, the Minister say, suggests that the reason is simply a short-term rise, but uh, the figures actually reveal, page 5 of the bulletin reveals a long-term trend in a rise in hospital complaints. Uh, does the Minister, can the Minister demonstrate to Parliament not the reasons that the good parts of the NHS are working, which we all know about, but that he understands why the bits of the NHS that are not working are doing so badly? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, we are using complaints as part of the management information in boards, and in fact, in some boards like Tayside and Grampian, uh, every complaint is actually treated as an adverse event, uh, which means very thorough investigation as to why something has gone wrong, so that lessons can then be learned to prevent it going wrong again. Uh, and obviously, with the rollout now also of patient opinion, we expect further complaints uh, coming through the patient opinion medium, which is readily accessible within hospitals to patients, to visitors, to carers, to family members, and indeed to staff. And as that is rolling out, we're seeing not only an increase in the number of complaints, but also a very substantial increase in the number of compliments being given by patients and others. And I would point out, of course, the very latest survey from the British Social Attitude Survey showing that over recent years there has been an increase of over 20% in the satisfaction rate of the National Health Service, something I think we should be proud of. John Scott. Thank you. Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the, BMA's, the BMA conference in Harrogate taking place today. This morning on Good Morning Scotland, uh, Dr Hal Maxwell from Ayrshire highlighted concerns of the BMA at falling GP numbers in Scotland. What is the Cabinet Secretary doing to address his, that is to say Dr Maxwell's, and the BMA's concerns about the lack of available GPs? Well, Presiding Officer, Dr Maxwell is from Ballantree, which is, of course, a fairly remote rural community within South Ayrshire. And there's a particular problem in rural communities across Scotland in terms of recruitment and retention. And I've spoken about it many times in this House. We have NHS Highland leading on behalf of all the health boards in Scotland. They've been given specifically £1.5 million to work with themselves uh, and their uh, people, as well as the uh, rest of the rural Scotland. Scotland to, to try new initiatives to retract and uh, retain GPs in particular in rural areas. I should point out that, in fact, we have increased the number of GPs in Scotland since 2007 by 5.6 per cent, and we have by far the largest number of GPs per head of anywhere in the British Isles. Uh, and I should say absolutely categorically, even although we are the best in terms of numbers, we are by no means complacent. And I do recognise, particularly with the increasing complexity of the cases presenting to GP surgeries, that we do need to put additional resources into the primary care sector, which is why, as part of this year's local delivery plans from health boards, I've instructed them to increase spending in the primary care sector. Eileen McLeod. Uh, thank you, presenting officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the 20 per cent increase in public satisfaction in Scotland's NHS in the last decade is testament to not only the hard-working NHS staff, but also to the approach of this government in supporting and protecting our NHS as a key public service, free at the point of delivery, in contrast to Westminster's creeping privatisation of NHS services south of the border? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, Presiding Officer. I totally agree with Aileen McLeod because every day I have to say I'm inspired by the excellent quality of care provided by our dedicated and hard-working NHS staff and I deplore some of the recent attacks on those staff such as at the neonatal unit in Wishaw. Uh, for example, yesterday I visited the Golden Jubilee Hospital which has now got the fastest turnaround time for dealing with heart attacks than any hospital 
anywhere in the United Kingdom. The target for turnaround from arriving at the hospital to be getting initial treatment is 30 minutes. They're doing it in 21 minutes, unmatched by any other hospital in the whole of the United Kingdom. I think that's something to be celebrated, presiding officer. And sometimes if we heard from opposition parties as much about the successes of the NHS, which far outweigh any potential challenges we face, then I think morale in the health service would be a bit higher. Richard Simpson. If I may very gently point out to the Cabinet Secretary a small correction, North East England has more GPs per head than Scotland, if he looks at the Four Countries report. But I wanted presiding officer to ask him about the whistleblowers line, which was eventually introduced by this government two years after the English line came into being. Uh, but we were promised an evaluation at some point of the feedback to individuals. We've had an initial evaluation, but not the evaluation on what the actual people who've complained feel about the responses. When is that going to happen? Presiding officer, first of all, the North East is not a country. <laughs> I, I, I know that might be news to a no campaigner, but there we go. Uh, can, I, can I tell the member the evaluation will be available next year? Clearly, it's a fairly new, a fairly new helpline, uh, and in fact is widely used by people from south of the border. And we'll extrapolate uh, whatever lessons we can learn about their health service as well as extrapolating our own, and we'll publish a very robust evaluation in due course. Question four, Jimmy McGregor. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the European Commission's proposal to lift the Faroe Islands herring sanctions that are in place to deter unsustainable fishing practices. Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead. The European Commission has unilaterally judged that the reduced catch limit for herring that the Faroe Islands has set itself for this year does satisfy the criteria for lifting the current trade measures. Whilst I acknowledge the downward shift, it does remain above the share set aside for them by the other parties in March of this year. And lifting the trade measures may now be premature, in my view, and could be seen as rewarding poor behaviour. The statement from the Commission that this does not form a commitment to a permanent share going forward is, of course, encouraging, but raises concerns about the process by which this position has been reached. I therefore intend to write to the UK Government in advance of a discussion on this issue in Brussels at the end of July to raise my concerns. My firm position is that shares should be agreed between all parties with an interest in the fishery, and I will seek to ensure that sensible decisions are taken and that Scotland's interests are protected. Um, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. But does the Cabinet Secretary share the genuine concern of Scottish pelagic fishermen that the Commission, without consulting EU member states, is sending out completely the wrong message by proposing to remove these sanctions, even when the Faroes have unilaterally set a herring quota which is double the figure they should be allocated under the previous Coastal States Agreement? Further, what is he going to do to ensure that there is a level playing field for pelagic fishermen when the discard ban is introduced in January, when Scottish skippers will face a huge amount of control and monitoring equipment on board, while the Faroese and Norwegians fishing alongside them off Shetland will not have any restrictions? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think I indicated in my answer to the member that I do share the views to a certain extent with the, the Scottish industry over how the European Commission have handled the trade sanctions with the, the Faroe Islands. But we should also recognise that there is progress being made and welcome that, because it's in everyone's interest that there is an agreement in the future of that stock. In terms of the level playing field between the Scottish pelagic sector and other countries in our waters post the discard ban for pelagic stocks in a year or so's time, um, I have made the strongest representations to the UK Government that they must absolutely deliver a level playing field. We cannot have control measures on Scottish vessels that fish alongside other vessels that have less control measures. Therefore, I am making the strongest representations to the UK Government. There is an internal debate going on between the, the two governments on this at the moment, and I hope that uh, Jamie McGregor will support the Scottish Government's position on that. Question six, Fiona MacLeod. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to inform doctors about the medical certificate of cause of death that is expected to be introduced in August. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presenting officer, a revised paper, Medical Certificate of Cause of Death, MCCD, or Form 11, will be introduced after midnight on 5 August 2014. To support this change over significant work has and is being undertaken to ensure a smooth transition from the current to the new form. The Chief Medical Officer signalled the change in a letter of 20th March 2014 to all NHS Chief Executives and Medical Directors 
for cascading to all staff, including GPs. A second, more detailed letter from the Chief Medical Officer is due to issue to the same recipients this week. The changeover will also be discussed with Health Board's nominated lead officers at a meeting on the 15th of July. Additionally, NHS Education Scotland are developing educational and awareness raising materials for dissemination to and use by all NHS boards before the changeover date. Fiona McLeod. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that co very comprehensive le reply and I'm pleased to hear how much work we've done in this. But can I also ask what sort of work we've done to inform funeral directors of the new MCCD? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, the medical certificate of cause of death is not a form that is normally made available to funeral directors, therefore there is no change to the current funeral arrangements from their prospectus. Nevertheless, the National Association of Funeral Directors, which represents 80 per cent of funeral directors in Scotland, is a key member of the overarching Death Certification National Advisory Group and has responsibility for informing its members of all relevant changes connected with this work. And this includes confirming that the revised MCCD will have no impact on its members at this time. Question six, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what opportunities the proposals in empowering Scotland's island communities could bring to Arran and Cumbria. Minister Derek Mackay. I visited both Arran and Cumbria to discuss the measures set out in empowering Scotland's island communities. Nearly all measures will apply to each of Scotland's 93 inhabited islands. Proposals to benefit Arran and Cumbria include revenue from the seabed, an island's provision in the interim constitution, an island's minister and a particular interest to Aaron top-up support to island beef farmers. Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that positive reply. I am pleased indeed that the proposals apply to all of Scotland's islands and will benefit Arn and Cumbria significantly. The prospectus recommends islands' innovation zones be set up by local authorities. Can the Minister confirm that if the communities on Arn and or Cumbria wish to set up such a zone, it would be actively considered? Minister. Yes, Scottish Government can uh, consider that proposal. Arran is an excellent example of communities and stakeholders coming together to, to promote that which is best about the islands, and we look forward to those proposals. Proposals. And Arne, like every other island in Scotland, will benefit from the opportunities of independence that can be unlocked with empowering Scotland's islands. Question 7, Jane Baxter. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress of its affordable housing supply programme. Minister Margaret Burgess. Our target is to deliver 30,000 additional affordable homes during the lifetime of this Parliament, two thirds of which will be for social rent. Excellent progress is being made as three years into our target we have delivered 19,903 affordable homes, 72% of these being for social rent. Jane Baxter. I thank the Minister for that answer. Many of my constituents who are unable to secure good quality housing are families. Sustainable communities need a mix of housing, and while councils across the country are working hard to ensure their local housing strategy meets communities' needs, more needs to be done. Some of this was covered in yesterday's debate, but can the Minister tell me what steps the Government is taking to ensure that they support councils, housing associations and developers in ensuring housing stock in each area is appropriate for communities and that we have enough family housing, and how will this be monitored? Minister. As a member will be aware, it's up to each local authority to set their own local housing strategy and, and their housing plan. The Scottish Government supports um, all tenures of housing across the sector. We have a wide range of schemes, from mid-market schemes to our, our social rent housing, to supporting um, owner ownership, owner ownership through the Help to Buy scheme. So the Scottish Government will continue to do that and work with the local authority of partners. But at the end of the day, it's up to each local authority to determine the type of housing they require for their area. Each local authority knows best what's needed in their local community. I can squeeze in question number eight if Ms McTaggart and the Minister are brief. Anne McTaggart. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to the reported 22 per cent increase in homophobic hate crimes in the last year. Cabinet Secretary Shona Roberts. The Scottish Government will continue to work closely with public and third sector organisations to address the causes of hate crime, to encourage victims to report hate crime and to improve the service offered to victims. Anne McTaggart. Thank the Minister for that response. It's been reported at 12% rise in disability hate crime and a 3% rise in racial abuse in the past 12 months. In light of these worrying statistics, what specific action is the government taking to reverse this trend and ensure that every community in Scotland is eradicated of prejudice and discrimination? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, in February this year, we launched uh, Speak Up Against Hate Crime, a campaign to raise awareness of what hate crime is and how to report it. Uh, we'll build on this work as we work with partners uh, across all of these organisations, of which many of those organisations, of course, at the time of the publication of the statistics, said that part of the reason for the rise <clears throat> was down to increased confidence in reporting such crimes um, and, of course, the third-party centres to, to help people report them. But we are not complacent and we'll do what else we need to do. Thank you. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Dr Pribicevic, the Ambassador of the Republic of Serbia. And members will also wish to welcome the delegation from the Network of Parliamentary Committees on Economy, Finance and European Integration of the Western Balkans. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne.